and welcome to the Open Book Channel. My name is Oli Ander, your designated Open Book. To celebrate the milestone of hitting 250 subscribers on my channel, I asked what some of you might like me to cover in a video. There were a couple great suggestions, but in the end, I decided to take up watching The Curse, as the channel's longest time supporter, Onions and Garlic, wanted to know my takeaways from it. For those unaware, The Curse is a TV show categorized as a satirical black comedy thriller. It was written by Nathan Fielder and Benny Safdie, who both starred in it alongside Emma Stone. The show follows a newly married couple as they film a TV show about their lives flipping houses and involving themselves in the Espanola community. The Curse received an exceptionally mixed reception. It's a bit of a love it or hate it piece of media. The Curse is praised for its concepts and masterful follow through in its directing style as commentary on reality television and just reality in general, who we are apart from the media that we consume. There are many great moments in The Curse to dissect that provide meaningful commentary, although the actual act of watching that presentation is full of a lot of awkward, meandering moments. It gets better the more that you think about it in hindsight, but quite often the act of watching it can be a bit of a bore. The Curse requires viewer interaction that is arguably unlike any other media being made in the present day. Its intention in a lot of moments is to induce discomfort, which I can totally understand is something most people don't want to endure in their minuscule free time. Fair enough, but I am a masochist, so I intently watched all 10 episodes. There is a lot to unpack in The Curse, and I honestly had a bit of a hard time deciding what I should focus in on. Looking into commentary on The Curse after the fact, it appeared as though a lot of the discourse was centered around theories on the meaning of the ending, and much smarter people than myself dissecting the concept's execution through the cinematography. So I decided that I'd like to talk about one of the few larger themes that were pervasive throughout the whole show that I can speak on with a little bit of authority, and that's art. More specifically, after a prelude into the pretentiousness of high art society and moralities, I'll dive into the value of art in relation to the artist's identity and when appreciation turns into fetishization. This topic is more relevant in today's social media climate than ever before. Online artists aren't just marketing their art, they're also expected to market themselves to some degree. Very rarely does art stand on its own, as most full-time artists have to make their living through online sales rather than physical galleries or shows. Being a creative nowadays has largely been taken over by being a content creator, although The Curse manages to tackle topics pertaining to art in both a traditional and commercial landscape. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Meet Whitney. Whitney is the wife in the titular duo starring in the flip thr- flip thrant flip- I cannot say it. Flip thranth- flip thranthropy? Flip thranthropy show within a show that is the curse. I cannot and will not get into commentaries on Whitney and Asher's work and its effect of gentrification because we will be here all day. <laughs> What is important to note, though, is that they are not simply buying and flipping houses, they are tearing down and building new houses designed by Whitney to be self-contained, carbon-neutral structures. And they look like this. Whitney considers her structures not just houses, but art, and she regards herself very highly for them. Enter the very first very awkward scene I would like to present you with to get an idea of the vibe of what the curse is all about. I think maybe it's like a little weird that you're not saying anything, you know, or that I'm just the only one talking. Can you can you say something back to me? Sure, like what? Um, I don't know, just, you know, we're two artists talking, like maybe compliment my work or something. <laughs> you make really cool homes. Can you say why they're artistic, just from your point of view as an artist? Yeah, um, the reflections say a lot and they're really beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. And then maybe could you could you just say um, why you love having your work in my home? I'm not really sure what you want me to say. I think you can just say um, my homes are so unique and um, so important as a piece of art and you're proud to have your work displayed inside. Your homes are so unique and so important as a piece of art and I couldn't be more proud to have my work displayed inside. <laughs> That is so sweet. The Curse covers a lot of aspects of art commentary over the course of its runtime, and in typical fashion to how it approaches other topics as well, there is a heavy dose of cringe that accompanies those moments. 
That said, it works so well. As someone who spent my schooling focused on art being in that community, it hit home not sore spots, but just brutally accurate ones. Much like this one. Whitney and Asher have invited Whitney's art quote-unquote friend, Kara, to dinner. So Whitney can ask her to be associated with the show. But the conversation quickly grows awkward and devolves, with Kara excusing herself before they've even gotten their food, after finding out that Whitney and Asher had planned to prominently feature her art in their show, which she is not okay with. This scene brings up multiple artistic concerns. The most blatant and easy to understand is the moment Whitney pries for Kara's agreement that isn't it ridiculous that her homes are being criticized as ripoffs of Doug Aiken's work? To which Kara responds, who cares? He's an artist and you're not. Obviously, Whitney defends that they are art, but also, well, <laughs> Aren't they ripoffs of Aiken? For context, Doug Aiken is known for creating mirrored homes meant to reflect back and blend into the nature surrounding them. Whitney gets flustered and argues that her homes reflect back the neighborhood around them, so they're not the same thing. And everything gets exceptionally awkward because I assume that any of you looking at this side by side will understand it is indeed undeniably the same thing. <laughs> It struck a special chord in me, having spent so many years studying art and being constrained by having to validate what seems like objectively questionable pieces for the sake of tact. Nobody likes a critic, but god, it is painful humoring pretentious artists or art that should be criticized. Not that I didn't pull my fair share of BS on art projects in school too, but if that wasn't the norm, it wouldn't have been so easy to get away with. Comparing Whitney's structures to Doug Aiken is a very valid point that she is unwilling to even humor. The next question that the scene raises is the artist's control over their work after sale. As much as it is good ethical practice for a TV show to credit art featured in it and provide compensation to the creator for its extended alternate use, does Kara have a right to deny use of her art in the show? Her art is a product that she sold. The owners upon purchase of that product are the ones that get to decide its use from that point forward. Of course, Kara has every right to be wary and want to say, but there's no way to maintain that control as a creator. Like I said earlier, artist representation is important for marketing and value of their work, so Kara is rightfully concerned with her art being prominently featured in a show because what if she doesn't align with it? It's a brand risk for her but that's just a risk that every artist has to take. And how do you navigate that in today's online world? The most important thing that this scene brings up, but addresses much deeper later on in the show, though, is Whitney's desire to hire Kara as a consultant for the show in the first place. The curse is very complex in the character pieces it constructs. It's hard for me to truly speak on Whitney's intentions or thoughts in a lot of cases. I don't know whether Whitney is a narcissist and unabashedly believes that she deserves recognition for her art regardless of the merit anyone else gives it, or whether she is just truly naive and swept up by the pretentiousness of the high art world, overvaluing anything and everything presented to her in a certain way including herself. <laughs> For example, the next scene that I'd like to discuss is Kara's art show, where Whitney very clearly doesn't understand what is being presented to her, but she conducts herself with a performative reverence for it all the same. Kara has an interactive performative piece at her show in which she sits in a teepee and guests are led in to sit with her one by one. As they sit there, Kara uses a meat slicer to slice off some turkey and hands it to the guest. Whitney eats the meat and Kara starts screaming. Whitney looks on at her, confused but very engaged, wanting to understand. Upon exiting the structure at the end of the performance, they are told not to discuss what happened in the tent. Whitney proceeds to ignore that and asks Asher about it, who went in the teepee after her. She is desperate for answers, which, bless him, he is not willing to discuss with her like a good boy, and even going so far as telling the governor of the San Pedro Pueblo, a leader of the local Aboriginal community that she invited to the show, that she doesn't think he's supposed to eat the meat before he goes in to take his turn with Kara. After Kara is done with her performances for the night, Whitney hovers and inserts herself into Kara's conversations with others, filled with nothing but praise, even though she clearly didn't understand what the message was. I'm in no way saying that there is no value to art if you don't understand it, but I personally find it not just pretentious, but 
maliciously dishonest when people like Whitney ignorantly accept the value of something that had no value to them. But that's not the end of this story, oh no no no. At the end of episode 8, which I showed earlier, where Whitney blatantly wants to use Kara as a puppet for her own gain in presentation, Whitney finally asks her what the meaning of the performance piece was. The painfully ironic conversation goes as follows. But okay, okay, I know I've said this to you a million times, but I am still so obsessed with your TP performance from your last show. I mean, it was just, it was so, it was just saying so much. And um, you can tell me, you've got to tell me, like, were, were we supposed to eat the turkey? <laughs> so the slicing of the meat is me giving pieces of myself to people, whether I want to or not. And as a native person, that's basically what you're doing every day, just fucking slicing off pieces of yourself. And it's exhausting. And whether people choose to eat it is totally up to them. And you eat it. That was so beautiful. Not only is the statement by Kara a beautifully ironic verbalization in lieu of the conversation that they just had, but it is also a conclusive thesis to Whitney's participation in that act, that system. Throughout the show, Whitney is obsessed with collecting and gifting native creations to other people as a way of virtue signaling her support for them, which is something that should be good in and of itself because she is paying them and educating others. But at what point does her own shallow understanding of the work's meaning turn into the very fetishization that she claims to oppose? Does Whitney want Kara as a friend because of who she is? or because she's a recognized artist? Does she want Kara involved in the show because she respects her opinion, or only because she desires her approval as a native? Is Kara even a person to Whitney, or is she just another aboriginal thing to surround herself with? As wrong as a lot of instances in the curse feel, the stance that it takes on this is neutral. It doesn't overtly draw a line for us with the complicated ethics of indigenous and by extension minority artists' work being fetishized by the high art world, because you really can't. It's a case of too much of a good thing, but a good thing is still a good thing. <laughs> At Kara's art show, Whitney talks to the governor while they stand by a piece that is essentially just a beaten up direction sign. Whitney says that the art is made by a non-indigenous creator. It's from a summer camp, and that's why she's chosen to damage the object. That's the way that Kara gets her art grants, these organizations. They want her to create art related to her indigenous heritage exclusively, which can be so stifling for an artist, you know? Of course, there are some artists that really embrace that, which is great, but it really is just such a fetish of the culture by the establishment. The irony of Whitney's treatment of Kara aside, it's hard not to agree with her on some level. First and foremost to these people, is Kara even an artist or is Kara simply a commodified native? Even more of Kara's pieces share that quality and provide that line of question than just the stolen damaged sign. When they enter the art show, the first thing that visitors see is a wall of baseball figurines. She's so good, it's annoying. She didn't make these, right? That's the point. These are actually sold at baseball games. So the piece is like recontextualizing? And she stole all of these from different stores. They're all stolen. It's brilliant because if the baseball league wants to charge her with theft, they would be forced to address their ignorance. But this type of art runs into critique of its value and how much artistry is actually involved. The concept is the core of the piece. The visuals of it aren't just secondary, but in this case, entirely irrelevant. Kara confronts this idea directly in episode 7. Whitney, as always, trying to insert herself into things, purchases an offensive statue from a golf course to present to Kara as a show of doing the right thing. Whitney misses the point of Kara's art installations in that their concept is strong because they are both stolen, and stolen by her, Kara, a native person. When Whitney takes it upon herself to acquire the statue, not only does she pay for it, it is not hers to give Kara, in a sense. It was not her initiative to take. Back to the artistry of the practice, though. As Whitney presents the statue, Kara says, Maybe I can just sign it right now and you can buy it. How about that? Whitney does not bat an eye at this, immediately giving it credit as being an original Kara Durand piece, 
if that instance came to fruition, if she literally just got a pen and wrote on it, Whitney would have happily paid for that despite the obvious backwards nonsense of the situation. It's much like the sculpture Fountain by Marcel Duchamp. Can someone slap their name on an object they did not make and call it art, and that have value because they placed it somewhere else despite their lack of involvement in the creation, or do you think that's just a load of crap in a urinal? I lean towards the latter, but I'm also not going to fault Kara for producing these types of work. She is making them for consumption by the very people that only value her art for the ability it has to be labeled by her heritage. So in a way, what is the point of her doing more? It will be valued the same because the value is not related to the actuality of the piece. I suppose the best way I can put it is that valuing art because of an artist's identity is not a problem, but valuing art only because of an artist's identity is. Because at that point, art isn't even part of the equation. The modification of a culture is the only thing that's valued. This reality becomes especially poignant the last time that Kara is shown in The Curse. Whitney does manage to get Kara to sign off on her work being used in the show, and buys into her good graces with a large sum of money to be a consultant, which is essentially a non-job. Despite that, Kara's artwork is not selling well, and she has to pick up work at a massage parlor. Whitney stumbles upon her there and awkwardly chooses to leave instead and leaves Kara with a very generous tip. And it is hard not to see this as pity money. Like, yes, Whitney has given Kara absurd amounts of money before, but that was under the guise of the perceived value of her art and her value as an artist, as a native. One gives value to the other, enhances the value, and yet, after all that trouble Whitney went through to convince Kara that they're friends, without the prestige of being a well-selling artist, Whitney has no use for her. Culture is only presented as useful insofar as its ability to be commodified, and Kara is only useful insofar as the prestige that it would give Whitney to be friends with a successful native artist. In a way, I guess it... Hold on, I just had a revelation. In a way, this last scene pulls the curtain away from the relationship that Whitney was trying to curate with Kara because it proves that the art never was the priority. The priority was the virtue signaling that Whitney gets to do in supporting her. As soon as art was taken out of the equation, Whitney decided to throw money and at and pay her anyway. So that really exposes the intentions of Whitney and what she really sees Kara as. Kara's storyline and the curse and the commentary her relationship with Whitney provides is ultimately tragic. She was caught in a vicious cycle of her art being valued solely for her identity and being unable to separate from that because she relied on that money regardless of how she felt about it and you can't control other people's opinions of you. Kara in turn lost her identity as an artist entirely as, as soon as her culture's commodification became a passing fad. In her career, was Kara ever really an artist or was she just selling her heritage? That question may sound like a harsh criticism, but it's really not. Aside from the fact that her work were repetitive, low-effort installment pieces that only recontextualize other objects, I've got no judgment for her character for taking advantage of that ability to earn. Get that bag while you can, girl. I'm sure there's some out there that will look at Kara as a character and call her a sellout for knowingly commodifying her identity, but I think in the end, when it comes to situations like this in the art world and outside of it, it's the art consumers, the Whitneys, to navigate that line of valuing alternative voices without fetishizing them or their significance. Like I went over in my previous video about NFTs and the value of art, I think art can have value from its aesthetic or its meaning, but in some cases it's on us, the consumers, to question and be wary of our intentions in what meanings we value and why. So that's all the art discourse I managed to glean from the curse. Please let me know if you had any differing opinions or interpretations of the scenes I discussed, or whether you have a different topic you might like me to cover. There's so many things to dissect in the curse. I didn't just find it hard to decide where to start, but I didn't know where I'd ever be able to stop. There, there's still more to talk about, even about art but I had to cut myself off. If you'd like to support me or this channel, you can find links to my Ko-fi in the description below. An extra special thank you to the Open Book supporters. You're the best, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.